Hello, welcome to using Open Policy Agent to meet evolving policy requirements. In this talk, I'm going to cover how my team has been using Open Policy Agent or OPA for around the last year in order to meet evolving requirements that we've faced as we've moved into new uh, regulated environments. My name is Jeremy Rickard. I'm a software engineer at VMware. And my team has really been focused on doing things in the Kubernetes space for the last few years. I'm also the Kubernetes 120 release lead, and I've worked on a number of open source projects uh, like Virtual Kubelet and Service Catalog for Kubernetes. If you'd like to reach out to me after this talk, feel free to ping me on Twitter uh, or the Kubernetes Slack where you can find me as uh, J-E-R-I-C-K-A-R. -E I'm also happy to respond to emails. So what does my team at VMware do? We're called the VMware Developer Platform, and we've got this long collection of words that describe what our team does. But if I boil it down to a really simple explanation, our team provides managed Kubernetes to VMware SaaS services, along with supporting infrastructure like maybe Vault or um, you know, creation of resources in AWS that might support what uh, those teams are doing. This project has been around since mid-2018, kind of gen generally available for uh, VMware SaaS teams. And the, the genesis of this thing was really focused on deploying clusters for multi-tenant use. So we would deploy uh, kind of shared clusters, and these clusters would have multiple tenants on them. These were deployed into Amazon, so running in public clouds, and available to the SaaS teams to deploy their workloads. Since we are running multi-tenant clusters, we kind of use namespaces as the, the level of isolation where we're enforcing that multi-tenancy. And we used RBAC pretty extensively in order to, to make that happen. So to really facilitate that, we also have a data plane that we run in something we call our management clusters. So when a user is going to use VDP, they use a, a CLI that we've written to maybe create namespaces or label namespaces, do things like that. Then once they have the namespace created, they're able to do pretty much whatever they want inside of that namespace and it belongs to them. They can define network policies, uh, things like that. But we very quickly came to see that that's not really sufficient for all the use cases. There were teams that needed to do more than just exist within one, maybe two namespaces. They needed the ability to create more namespaces, do other things on the cluster. And doing that doesn't really fit into that multi-tenant cluster kind of, uh, kind of model. So we also have evolved to support non-shared clusters. We call these uh, tenant uh, cluster per tenant. And in those cases, they get much more access to the cluster. They can do things like create namespaces. They, they get nearly cluster admin access instead of having to rely on our data plane to do a lot of that stuff. But at the same time, we have resources that we deploy that are really you know, required for the cluster to operate successfully. So we come to this challenging point of tenants really having what amounts to cluster admin. They can do a lot of things that might impact the operation of our system. But we also have resources that we want to protect. And RBAC wasn't really sufficient to handle all of those things. Maybe we need to validate that somebody can do something based off of their org membership in an external system. So thinking about how we might solve that problem, we realized pretty quickly that uh, webhooks, you know, the mutating uh, dynamic admission control that's available in Kubernetes would really solve this problem or give us a point where we could write some extensions to make that happen. If you're not familiar, when you do something like a kubectl apply, um, the, to the, the tool in the CLI makes a call to the Kubernetes API. It does some basic authentication checks to make sure you're authorized and authenticated to do what you're trying to do. And then it moves into the dynamic admission control. In that, you can define uh, mutating webhooks, which might make changes to the request coming in, maybe inserting a sidecar pod or changing labels, doing things like that. Finally, it moves on through the chain until it gets to the validating webhooks. And there, it makes decisions about whether the, uh, the request should be allowed or not. You know, maybe it's checking parts of the, the request against other things in the system. Uh, to make sure that it, that should be allowed, or maybe it's checking something against an external uh, system. So we ended up writing a webhook to do some of this. And it was focused on protecting the resources that VDP manages in the clusters, but allowing them to do most everything else. So when a request comes into a VDP managed namespace where we have deployed things, we can, can analyze who's making the request and either allow it or not allow it. This uh, really became a great just general extension point for us to add new functionality that we couldn't directly express with, uh, with role-based access control. But as our scope started to grow, 
you know, we onboarded more tenants. We also started to pick up some additional um, places where we needed to run. We needed to, you know, follow our tenants to where they needed to be. And the first place they needed to be beyond our normal commercial uh, AWS regions was GovCloud and uh, the Amazon Gov GovCloud. And our tenants wanted to start pursuing FedRAMP certifications, starting with Fed FedRAMP moderate, moving into FedRAMP high. So we recently just completed an effort to help uh, the VMware Cloud and AWS team secure a FedRAMP high certification. And doing that meant that we needed to evaluate a lot of what we were doing and you know, look at the requirements for that certification process, find the gaps in what we had deployed already and start to evolve to fix those things. Shortly after, we started to support a PCI certification effort for VMC again. Each one of these new environments brought new requirements. When you consider FedRAMP high, there's over 400 different controls that you have to, to meet in order to get that certification. PCI has a completely different set of requirements. A lot of them are similar, but there's also differences between them. You need to really review each one of these things against what you've deployed and how you're operating to make sure that you're fitting into that. Um, those requirements. Does Kubernetes directly meet all of those things? Probably not. And in our case, we, we didn't try to, to justify each one of those things with Kubernetes. One of the, the nice things about getting these certifications is that they've realized that not every requirement that's written can be directly applied to every business case or every uh, computer system. They've allowed for what they call compensating controls. And a compensating control can be applied to almost all PCI requirements. And it, it really says that if this requirement can't be directly applied for technical reasons or business reasons that are documented, you can go ahead and identify additional problems that help mitigate the risk that those controls are meant to address. And for us, that was a great way for us to take the Kubernetes clusters and the other stuff that we've deployed for our tenants and figure out how we can augment those things, maybe with policies or maybe some additional things we deploy that can help to really reduce those risks. And as we looked at each one of these things and considering that we have lots of different clusters, you know, we're deploying uh, in the commercial regions, US West 2, US East 1, um, various APAC or, or Europe regions. When we look at those and compare them to the GovCloud uh, deployments, they're pretty different and the requirements for them are pretty different. We do have a base set of security things that we have to follow for VMware security, obviously. Um, any, any VMware service that's gonna be deployed has to go through a set of um, security validation and to make sure that it's gonna meet our internal requirements. But when we move into these other environments, there's more and more restrictive uh, things put in place. So we obviously don't wanna force all of these requirements onto the tenants that don't need them because that would make uh, their jobs harder. We want to be uh, an enabling feature for them, help them be successful. That doesn't seem like it fit really well with our webhook model uh, because we would be adding you know, different features that we would have to, to probably feature flag in different clusters, keep track of all those different things. It's additional code we'd have to write and test every time we wanted to make one of these new uh, features available. Then it would have to go through our whole rollout process and uh, just be a little bit more complicated than we think would be um, great. And we also, thinking about this problem, want to make sure our users don't hate us. Additionally, some things we, we really wanted with you know, this change, uh, these new things we wanted to apply, was that we didn't really want to require new code for each one of these things. We didn't want to have to make changes to our existing webhook uh, code. It's written in Go. Uh, we build it into a Docker container. We deploy it. Um, it rolls through our pipelines, uh, goes through a full upgrade process. If we wanted to make uh, individual changes to, the, to that thing every time we had to identify one of these new policies that we needed to enforce, that would get a little bit complicated. So we wanted to require something that didn't really require new code. We also wanted to make it easy for the team to learn. So we wanted to, to not require them to learn a brand new you know, programming language from the ground up. Um, obviously, there's probably going to be some domain-specific language uh, involved, something that looks like code, but we didn't want to force you know, everybody on the team that's not a Go developer to learn Go in order to build new policies like this. And finally, while we don't want to go through the process of doing a full upgrade every time and rolling these things out and going through the whole process, we do want to make these things testable so we can make sure that when we're defining these new policies, 
however they're going to be applied, that we can test them before we roll them out. So we're not breaking things down the road. So we looked at all of these requirements. You know, the fact that we want to have this kind of applied on a cluster by cluster basis. We wanted to make sure that we could satisfy these wants. And we did a search uh, across the CNCF landscape and we really identified something that we think would help us, we thought would help us quite a bit. And it turns out that was OPA, Open Policy Agent. Open Policy Agent is pretty extensible. Uh, it provides its own language for defining what policies look like. And we'll look at that in just a second. And it turns out it integrates pretty well with Kubernetes. Uh, there's a project called Gatekeeper that I uh, highly recommend you take a look at. We ended up not using Gatekeeper for a few reasons that I'll get into as we go through the talk, uh, mostly because when we started this journey, um, it was pretty early days for Gatekeeper. And uh, we ended up going with the cube management approach, uh, which runs cube management and OPA together like in a sidecar manner. It ends up looking something a little bit like this. Uh, just like we wrote our own webhook, uh, validating uh, admission controller, this plugs in in pretty much the same way. So when you deploy OPA and queue management together, you can register them as validating and mutating webhooks. They plug into the API server just like any other webhook would. So when a user is making a request with kubectl, uh, CICD pipelines maybe are using the API directly, maybe using kubectl themselves, or when in controllers inside of the cluster are making changes to objects and resources via the API server, everything goes through that normal admission process. An admission request hits OPA. OPA looks at that request, determines if any of the policies that you've applied should, um, should result in a deny or a block. And then it sends that response back and the API server handles that appropriately. So let's look at a really simple example of what a policy might look like. Here we want to deny any request that comes in that's labeled with a certain value. So you can see that this is really a declarative language. We're saying a series of facts, or in this case, really just one fact. And then if that fact is true, then we're setting a variable value of this getting returned. So we start this off with a deny block. So the, the keyword deny. And in that is a message uh, that's going to be returned. And then the first line in this is really the statement that we're checking, the policy we're enforcing. So in this case, if the metadata has a label um, called pants with a value of sweatpants, then the message we're going to send back is you can't sit with us. And if you notice in that line, input.request.object, that's really coming from the Kubernetes admission request. If you look at the JSON that makes up a Kubernetes admission request, it's got those pieces of it. So it's really great in this policy, you're able to say, um, I want to work at the metadata of this object that's coming in, or maybe I want to look at the spec of this object that's coming in. Maybe I want to look at the, the, the verb. Is this a create or an update? Maybe I want to apply policies differently that way. It's really flexible and gives you a lot of power without having to go write you know, new code. It's still code, obviously. You're still writing some declarative statements. And you still have to end up putting those in the cluster somehow. But it's, it's a much simpler path forward. To test this, OPA provides a lot of tooling. Um, and you can actually uh, take this stuff and put it into a uh, OPA Playground. I have a link to that at the end of the presentation. Um, just to test these things without having to run anything locally on your machine, you can you can build out a sample test document and just build out your sample policy and just and run uh, the validation in this playground, and it's pretty cool. So with all of that in mind, let's talk about a few use cases that we have solved uh, with Open Policy Agent and Rego. And for each one of these, I'm going to go through three examples. I'm going to loosely tie this back to um, some control or some rule that we found in FedRAMP or PCI that uh, we needed to apply to our system. And the first of those is the use of external information systems. Inside of this requirement, there's a whole bunch of different rules and a lot of different individual control points. But the one I'm going to focus in on is information systems that are outside of the authorization boundary really qualify as those external information systems. So we deploy our, in GovCloud, we deploy Kubernetes into those FedRAMP environments. And we deploy a lot of other things in there. We, we try to minimize our reliance on external resources, things that are outside of that authentication boundary. And one of those things is a Docker registry. So in production, in our commercial environments, we're using a hosted service from JFrog that's not available to us to use directly as part of our FedRAMP offering. So we needed to run our own registry in, in boundary. So inside of that GovCloud environment, we have our own Docker registry that we're running. 
and we push all of our images to that. So then when we want to deploy stuff into the cluster, we need to reference those images. We also want to make sure that the cluster isn't running things that it's directly pulling from the internet. There is some connectivity. Um, or, or there was originally, we've locked it down since then, but originally you were able to, to pull things from Docker Hub or pull things from our JFrog um, hosted solution. So the first thing we looked at with OPA was how do we restrict the use of those other registries? We want to really lock it down to just the one. So we want to make sure that requests that are coming in only come from that uh, registry that we really want them to come from. So one of the first policies we built was a pretty simple one that would look at the, the image that's being used by containers. So this policy really is cool and it lets us restrict the um, any request that's coming in to only those that come from certain repositories. So in this case, we start off again with uh, that deny block. And the first thing we look at is, does this kind, uh, the, the, the kind of this request, so just like um, you, know, you deal with uh, kinds in Kubernetes, we're checking that here. So an admission request will come with whatever type of object you're dealing with. So we really only want to apply this to pods. And uh, you know, could, we could do this at different levels. We could look at the deployments, replica sets. This was the simplest for us to just look at when a pod is created, is the container using something, that, using the registry that we expect it to use? And it's a pretty simplistic check. So we iterate through all of the images. So obviously um, you can have multiple images in a, uh, in a pod spec. And we want to make sure that each one of those things is, is, uh, is valid. So we start off with the second line or, uh, of the block, sum i. So like just for every image that exists in this array of input.request.object.spec.containers, let's grab that thing and validate it. So then for each one of those images, we, we basically just say, does this image start with uh, what our, you know, our uh, gov repo is? I replace it here with VMware is awesome just for, for notional purposes, but you can see the, you know, we're making a little bit more complex policy here by calling into that function. When this evaluates true, when the first line is it's a pod, and when it, this is not a GovCloud image, we're going to return the message, pods container is not allowed to use the image from a non-approved repo in Gov. So what's that look like in practice? So using this deprecated functionality of creating a pod uh, with kubectl run, we're still running fairly old clusters, so I can still do this. Um, I'm going to try to run uh, an MQ test client from my uh, personal Docker Hub account. So I run that with kubectl run. Uh, that cr actually behind the scenes right now in that version of Kubernetes creates a deployment. And that deployment that will then spin up pods. I don't get an error here, though, because my policy was really applied to just the pod. So to kind of work around that, or to see how, it, like what feedback you get, let's take a look at the events. We can run kubectl get events and uh, filter that down to open policy agent um, in, the, in the string. And you can see that we can actually create the pod. And if I did a kubectl get pods here, you would see that there were no pods created for this deployment. And it's specifically showing that error message that I created before. So this was great. And we were able to uh, lock all of the registries down make sure that we weren't deploying anything from you know the non-controlled things that were inside of the boundary. But now we have some fairly unhappy users. And our goal all along, the, I mentioned this at the beginning, was to make sure that the users didn't hate us. We wanted to make sure that things were as easy as possible for them. And not every one of our tenants is super versed in Kubernetes. They're using Kubernetes. Um, they, they realize the benefits of deploying their stuff onto, onto the platform. Um, they're, they're along for the ride for GovCloud. But us adding this constraint makes it a little bit more difficult for them. They either have to go um, maintain a separate set of values files if they're using Helm or some other tool that does a kind of templating and overlaying. Maybe their Helm chart doesn't even allow them to really template that because they've, uh, they've not done a super great job of, of templating that stuff out. So there were changes that had to be made there. So we thought, what can we do to help with that situation? And I mentioned this earlier, but you can actually run OPA as a mutating webhook in addition to a validating webhook. So what's the big difference there? Well, when it runs as a validating webhook, we, we had those, those blocks and they started with deny. And what happens there is when all of the rules match for a deny, the validating webhook functionality will say, this request is not allowed, here's the error message. But just like every other mutating webhook, OPA can also update your resource. And it does that by generating JSON patches. 
the syntax gets a little bit more complicated and I'm not going to show you the entire thing here, but I'm going to show the pretty, like the relevant parts. So here we've defined two uh, variables, uh, VDP repo. So it's going to map, you know, be whatever our upstream public uh, managed JFrog thing is. And then also whatever our GovCloud, um, the host, you know, the host name for our, our, our GovCloud, GovCloud repo is. And then instead of using the deny block, we're going to define a patch block, which is going to return whatever JSON patch needs to be applied. So in this case, we have a couple of extra things here. Uh, I probably should have removed from the example, but we first want to make sure is mutation allowed. So we want to, to validate that the type of resource that we're going to mutate is something we, we want to mutate. We have some rules built around um, you know, what namespace it's in or uh, what labels it might have on it. Uh, specifically labels around uh, disallowing mutation. So we have a label that we've put in place for some of our components where we don't want to mutate like this because uh, it could lead to un unexpected consequences. But we, we essentially check to see if that exists or not and then move on. And then just like the deny rule, we're going to iterate over all the containers. And then we're going to check to see if that container matches the upstream public repo and replace it with the downstream value. If any of that generated a new value, then we're actually going to make the JSON patch here. Uh, so I've removed some of the, the bits about actually making the JSON patch. And I'll link to the documentation at the end of the, the talk. But uh, what will happen here is that when we make a request, uh, so maybe we're going to Helm deploy um, some deployment, and it's going to reference our upstream JFrog our, uh, repository, this code will actually get invoked. It'll look at that request that's coming in and say, oh, hey, you're using the upstream version. We can't use that in GovCloud. Let me go ahead and mutate that for you. So when this actually hits the API server, or sorry, etcd, it's going to actually get the Gov repo instead of the upstream repo. So it'll try to pull that down and it'll work um, just like we would expect it to work. But we've made it a little bit transparent to the, to the end users. So that's the first use case that we had that we solved with OPA. As we got further and further into the process, one thing that um, kind of bit us was uh, this next requirement. It's in PCI, but it's also in GovCloud, but I like the, the wording here a little bit more. Um, and this is PCI requirement six, develop and maintain secure systems and applications. So there's a lot, of, a lot of things to unpack in that terminology, but specifically 6.1, uh, underneath of this requirement is that you need to establish a process to, to basically scan for vulnerabilities. And when you identify these vulnerabilities, you have to remediate things that are medium or higher. So you get different severity levels, uh, and these are based off of CVSS scores. And when you get these things, you have, um, depending on the certif like whatever certification you've achieved, you have n number of days to fix them. So like in GovCloud, we have 30 days to fix things. Um, it's, it's not a long time, but it's also not a short time. But as we deploy a ton of stuff, we found as we went, you know, we went through this initial process, we found a lot of containers that we were deploying that actually had a number of vulnerabilities. So as I mentioned, uh, these things are based off of CVSS scores. So in the PCI case, anything that's medium or higher, which is a CVSS score of four or more, you actually have to remediate or you will fail your PCI audit. Uh, and any re, um, reinvestigation or, uh, you know, subsequent audits that you go through. You have to demonstrate that you've been doing these things and fixing these things. And you, you can do this, you can check this yourself. Um, there's a, a number of tools you can use. Uh, we happen to use Twistlock, but uh, you can use an open source tool from Aquasec called Trivi that'll do pretty similar things. Um, just a really quick example of what that might look like. I scanned one of the images that we have deployed in uh, our commercial environment. And you can see that it found a number of vulnerabilities. Um, two of them are critical, three were high, uh, four were medium, and three were low. So we definitely have to fix those criticals, those highs, and for PCI, we need to fix those mediums. What kind of things do you find inside of that? Um, so these can be OS level vulnerabilities. Uh, you could say like the version, you're running a, an Ubuntu based container and it's got a glibc vulnerability inside of it. That'll come up in these scanners and that will get flagged by one of the auditors. So it may not really be a problem, but um, it's best to, for us at least, to the least amount of effort is to fix the problem. It can also be application level things. So in this case, this is a Java application and 
The problem here um, is actually the version of log4j that it's using. So how do we fix this process? How do we, um, how do we, you know, the VDP team handle fixing these things? How would anybody else really handle these things? Well, you generally need to build some new container to do this. Uh, updating libraries, maybe applying OS updates inside of the container if you're using something like uh, um, Photon if you're a VMware person or Ubuntu or Debian as base images. So we built a little process around that for ourselves. And that involves taking whatever the base image that we have. So maybe it's uh, some upstream component that's based off of Alpine or some upstream component that's based off of Ubuntu. We write a new Docker file we take the old one as the, the, the from line. So if you're building a Docker file out, first line is from whatever. Then we run whatever the OS appropriate updates are just to make sure that we apply those things. And then we add in, uh, if it's something we've built, we add in, uh, you know, we make sure that we've rebuilt that with whatever the updated libraries are. And voila, that results in a new tag, hopefully without any vulnerabilities. Then we need to deploy that to the cluster. So we go and maybe we run a Helm update or a K app deploy whatever functionality we're, we're using. But then we have to repeat this process whenever the vulnerabilities happen. So for us, we scan this pretty, pretty regularly. Um, and we automated that by building this, you know, these images pretty much every day. So twice daily, actually, we run through that process. Um, we build all of the images that we've identified in our inventory file, uh, which is of course the YAML file. And we update those things to generate new tags. Then we update the inventory file. And then we somehow need to deploy that to the Kubernetes cluster. And we want to do this in a not really manual way. So we were able to pretty, pretty easily automate the front half of that process where we would rebuild these containers. We've already written the Docker files for them. Um, we have the, the skeleton of the inventory. How do we then take that and deploy it? So one of the cool things is that OPA, especially when you're using um, the cube management sidecar, is that you get access to other resources in Kubernetes. And it acts just kind of like any other Kubernetes client would, where it establishes a watch and sees things from the API server. So we put that into a config map in the cluster. It lists out the name of the image and then what version we want to run. And then the OPA uh, sidecar, cube management, sees that those things have changed and makes them available as a data field to OPA. You can access it uh, like this. So next, we can write a pretty simple policy uh, that looks at that inventory and compares that to what's deployed and then mutates the tag. So our, we again start with a patch block. We iterate through all the images in the, uh, in this case, the init containers. We do this for the init containers and the regular containers. Uh, obviously, we want to update both. Um, call this update Im image version function, which returns us back a modified version of that reference. And then we make a patch off of that and return it uh, as just part of the mutation process. Just like we did with the repos, we're now updating the tag to match what we have in our CI CD system. So now our inventory file gets deployed to Kubernetes. We deploy that as a config map. That gets reloaded by OPA. And then we run a small job that just labels, uh, touches the labels on all our deployments, which then forces them to go through the emission process again. That forces the mutating webhook, in this case OPA, to update all the tags and then start up again with all of those new, um, hopefully vulnerable, vulnerability-free images. So the last policy that we really wanted to enforce was running as non-root. And running as non-root, um, we're doing mostly with pod security policies. Pod security policy, uh, works pretty well and is pretty easy for our tenants to understand, except when they don't pay attention to the notifications we send and don't make changes to their, 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 uh, their YAML. So all of a sudden, my pods won't start. What's going on? Well, did you specify the context, uh, the security context in your YAML? Oh, you mean I have to update my chart again? So again, we bring mutation to bear here. And in this case, we take, um, Again, checking to see if mutation is allowed. Uh, we look to see if the, the, the spec already has a security context defined. And if it doesn't, then we make another patch where we actually um, add in the run as user and FS group to make this thing run uh, as, non, as non root. The great thing here is, though, when the users are making these calls and they're, they're deploying their stuff, they can actually specify whatever security context they want and we won't mutate it. This is just a nice add on for them uh, when they don't have that done. So recapping, what have we what have I uh, what did we learn? The VDP team learn. Um, OPA is really flexible. 
um, validation can get you pretty far. You can write a lot of deny rules to lock your clusters down and do a lot of things. Uh, but mutation can get you even further. You can do a lot of things when you combine these two things together. Rego is pretty, pretty easy to learn. Um, the declarative nature of it just makes it pretty easy for people to pick up. And uh, we have found that it's pretty easy for all the team members to really learn it and start writing new policies or fix problems we found in the policies. And then with those in mind, we were able to balance our security needs pretty closely with um, our desire to make the user experience as nice as possible in this uh, security world that we're living in. But let's go back for a second and talk about the, the mutation aspect of this. I have mixed feelings about mutating webhooks. And if you read the documentation, uh, the Kubernetes documentation, there's actually some call outs to say, hey, you should probably be aware of these things and maybe it's not the greatest case. And one of them is that users don't necessarily know what's happening. They may be confused by like, well, what this thing that I've created uh, doesn't look like what's in the, the cluster now, what happened? Um, we actually had that problem with the security context mutation. As we were going through this process, people weren't specifying um, security policies on their, their, uh, their deployments, and then actually tried to run as root and gave us an excep exception request where we created uh, security service accounts for them, um, things like that. But they didn't declare the security context because they were just let, you know, depending on our automation, our, our easy mode access for that. So think about the things you want to do with mutation um, and, and maybe use it judiciously and think about what impacts uh, it may have downstream. So here's some great links if you want to kind of follow up on these. Um, if you want to read more about the FedRAMP high requirements or the PCI uh, standards, I've linked them both here. Um, Play.openpolicyagent.org is great to go experiment and mess around with policy. Um, there's a great tutorial uh, linked here as well and like how to validate ingress in the cluster. And then finally, um, one of the reasons we didn't use Gatekeeper was that it doesn't do mutation yet. But there's an open issue here, and maybe by the time KubeCom comes around, this will be done. Uh, I would totally advise you to follow this and, uh, and give Gatekeeper a, a try if you're going to look at OPA, especially if you want to do uh, just uh, validating sort of things at the moment. So at that point, I'll turn it over to questions. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them now. Thank you so much.